he was like, dude, you, you practically wrote a story about my life. I know, <laughs> and it's yeah, he he you know he was like, it's weird because we don't know each other, yeah. and you wrote this movie about my life. So how did you come up this, with this inspiration? This story was based on this um, this idea. Um, came out of I was performing at the Opera Citizens Brigade Theater in New York City and um, I, I was, my, my wife came one night and she said it's, inter it's interesting to watch this group on stage because it's um, everyone's sort of equally funny and talented and, and yet off stage you know this person's a movie star this person's an, on SNL this person lives on an air mattress in Queens and when she said that I just thought I could picture a movie of that. Like it, it, to me, it felt like sort of a big chill type of comedy set in the world of an improv theater. And I just thought, I have to write this. I feel like no one's written this movie, and I, I really felt compelled to do it. So, if you're a comedian, and if you don't end up having your own talk show, or if you don't end up being Saturday Night Live, if you end up, don't end up having your own sitcom, are you, you know, considered a failure then if by, by mid thirties? If you're still, I think in my twenty, I think in my twenties, that's what I thought. <laughs> I think, I don't think that's true, but I think that that's what, I, I feel like in my 20s I had this sense that success meant this one thing, like having a sitcom, having a movie career, having a, a, a talk show, whatever it is. And then in my 30s I started to have this realization that success doesn't have to be this one thing, it can be anywhere on the spectrum of these, of, of uh, you know, uh, uh, any number of things on a certain spectrum. And that that's a pretty freeing realization. You know, like I, I was always chasing like sort of the brass ring and then I realized that the, that maybe that's not what's right for me. You know, what's right for me is making writing these solo shows and making writing these movies and directing these movies and working in a small setting um, with low budgets and making exactly what I want instead of with big budgets making something that I kind of want. I actually had a running document on my desktop since the first movie called um, Instructions for Movie Number Two, and uh, and it's a long document. It's like five pages long. Some of it is just like roll long, shoot, you know, roll early, cut late, you know, more footage. Um, shoot silent scenes, Sin silent versions of what you're shooting so that the coverage might need less dialogue than you need. I think sometimes you can express in a look much more than, than you're expressing with dialogue. You know, there's a lot of lines that are just cut and it's just a look. And in cinema, it's more powerful. It can be more powerful. Um, you know, no assholes on the crew and the cast. I, I've no, I, I realize how short my life is. Uh, with the first movie and I was like I'm going to work with all people who are great and so I'm going to check everybody's references a lot and then I, I wrote down this, this thing I read in an Ilya Kazan book where he's about directing where he said when he's interviewing actors and I think this is true of all hires ask, ask the person why they want to do it what about this, the script that interests them and don't lead them to the answer you know, I have this habit as an improviser of finishing people's sentences, like, what's interesting to you about this movie? And they say, well, it's a comedy, and I'm like, and a drama! You know what I mean? Like, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a big flaw that I have. It's a big foible. Um, so it's just something that I, I you know, that, those are a few of them, but there's a zillion. Hire, you know, hire people way early, you know, months and months in advance. Hire your cinematographer, your production designer, Take advantage of the fact that it's an independent film, so people aren't doing it for money, and so you might as well invite people to town early, invite actors to town early to rehearse scenes, but don't require it. Um, same thing with you know, scouting locations around the city. Just walk the city, find shots with your cinematographer. Things that you know, on studio film you can't quite pull off because they're breaking a thousand different rules and some studio is liable but when you're making an indie film it's like you're all in it you're all no one's in it for the money anyway if you were then you wouldn't be making this movie 
I was not on The Good Wife. I was on Orange. I was on Orange is the New Black. I was on uh, Girls. A lot of, yeah. A lot of people who look like me are on The Good Wife. <laughs> They've definitely been trying to cast clones of me. Josh Charles, I get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> From which, which thing? Which thing? Oh, my movie, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Who, Miles? We've all met Miles. <laughs> Miles is in England. Miles is in Canada. Miles is in Chicago, New York, San Francisco. There's a Miles in every city, and often too many. Too many Miles in every city. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not based on anyone, but it's certainly an archetype in that universe, and in a lot of, you know, academia and theater and... and any number of places where there's hierarchical systems, I think. Um, but to, to, to delve into what you were saying, um, I, what was the end part of it? Right. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, a lot of the movie is about asking a question like, what is success? And doesn't, you know, it doesn't answer it. I think a lot of times drama doesn't answer questions as much as it explores questions and makes you as the audience member think about that question in relation to your own life. And I think that if there's anything that the movie achieves, it's to make people laugh and, and entertain them and have some sense of questioning what success really means in their own life. Because I feel like we have this cultural understanding of success that it's this one thing and that it's, I think a lot of times it's, people think it's visibility. They mistake visibility and exposure for success, but in fact, I think success has a lot more to do with affecting people and connecting with people and helping people, contributing in some way. And I feel like that's often lost in this culture. Yeah. Sure, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, it was very important. I mean, um, it was loosely based on this a, a friend of mine from my improv group in my early 20s, my friend Chris, who um, at a certain point he, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's loosely based in the sense that at a certain point his girlfriend had a kid, uh, was a single mother, and he fell in love with her and fell in love with like that life and was commuting back and forth from New York to Chicago and finally was just like, I just want to go and be a dad and be a husband. And, and I was like, but Chris, like, we're going to make it. You know what I mean? Like, and he's like, I made it. You know what I mean? Like, and there, and there is that sense of like, he had much more perspective at that age and that was always interesting to me. I haven't. That's why I'm here. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I, I, I think the, of course, it, yeah. No, of course, of course. No, I get why you're asking. Um, it's like, I think that the moment any, you know, when I was, like a, a junior in college, and I started working the door at the Washington D.C. Improv, and I could watch the comics for free because I was working at the door. I made it. That's how much I love comedy. Like I love stand-up comedy, and I love comedy. So in some sense, it was like that. Me being like, 
oh, if I could just watch comedy for free, like these shows that I couldn't afford to go to, like, that's totally making it. And then, like, when I was 24, like, I was on Letterman. I was like, oh, now I've made it. And, the, you know, and then when I made my first movie, I'm like, now I've made it. And, and there's this sense of, like, along the way of you have these victories and then you have so many challenges that intermittently come at you in the middle of these, you know, in between these things that you can lose perspective and lose sight of that often. I mean, I feel like I feel like I made it now because I've been able to make three one-person shows and two feature films in the last eight years and outside of the system. And, and, and I feel really lucky to have been able to do that. It was pretty wild. I mean, I... I uh, my favorite was this guy stood up at one of the Q and A's and he just goes, "I'm old. I'm the oldest person in this room," and I, I was, uh, I really wanted to hate this movie because I hate young people, <laughs> and I loved it. And I was like, "What's the question?" He's like, "I don't have a question." <laughs> but in some ways, that was really rewarding. Because I wanted, when I was writing it, I mean, I wrote 12, 13, maybe 15 drafts of this. I wanted to write a human story. I wanted it to appeal to people who are 15, who think maybe that's what my 20s or 30s will be like. I wanted to, I wanted to relate to people who are 90 who say, oh, I remember when I was 30. So, Go ahead. Try to stay calm because you're like my biggest hero. Of all oh, time, so. thank you. Thanks. But like I've seen you live twice. I saw the joke store and the uh, my girlfriend's boyfriend tour in Ann Arbor live. And I'll never forget the end where you lit the Olympics. Yeah. Like, I'll never forget that. I was wondering. From my girlfriend's boyfriend. Yeah. Because storytelling yeah. is just so good. Were there people that inspired you, or where was the point where you were like, I know how to tell a story now? Well, with storytelling, I think that the the gold standard is Richard Pryor. I think everybody who came after Richard Pryor was looking at him going, I'm going to try to do something like that because that's better than anything anyone's ever seen. It's vulnerable. It's hilarious. It can be sad. I mean, I, my director of, of the stage show, of Sleepwalk With Me, is this guy, Seth Barish, and I remember he and I watched uh, Live from the Sunset Strip because of the scene where he talks about being on fire when he's freebasing on cocaine where it's so real ultimately like he doesn't pull any punches he makes you feel what it feels like to to be on fire for god's sakes and the pain of the of the bandages coming off in the hospital and, and that was our our guiding uh model for sleep with me in a lot of ways same with my girlfriend's boyfriend and, and uh and and thank god for jokes is like you know, you want to have something that not just is making people laugh, but is making people feel something. I think is is pretty is pretty awesome. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I will botch that so hard. I'm not an, I'm not an impressionist. Yeah. I would argue it's cinematic. Uh, <laughs> um, but I will say, I mean, I am not. An, I'm not actually an avid reader of novels. I am a massive consumer of films. I love character-based films like Broadcast News and Hannah and Her Sisters, The Big Chill. I feel like it's almost like a bygone era of films that are just about friends and people and and it's not so cut and dry and there's no villains and there's comedy and there's sadness and there's like, it's this m blend of all these things and so I, I feel like my inspiration in some ways is films from another era. Oh yeah, yeah. Go and just see this one last question he was in the middle of saying. Oh, cool. The scenes and the dynamic of the group. But I was just curious to hear about the scenes, what kind of you scripted, and how hard was it to keep them organic and really 
Well, I would definitely, I mean, the, the, yeah, the scenes are scripted and um, and then we would do, while we were in those costumes, we would do like 10 minutes of like real improv. And that stuff is kind of sprinkled through the movie. I mean, in some ways I wanted it to feel like the movie once, where you kind of don't even know where it begins and ends. You're just like, you the moment it ends, you're like Googling it. You're like, are, these people are real, right? You know what I mean? Like, they must be real. And that's why in some ways it's such a miracle that... Gillian Jacobs is the one who pulled it off. She has the least improv experience among us, and yet she's like in the movie the heart of what it is to be an improviser. And I've had like brilliant improvisers come up to me in Chicago, New York, and LA saying like she really carries the torch for, for the improv community, and she's not even from that background. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, I have to hop, but thanks for doing this, you guys. Congratulations.